Pig and Whistle Tales from Azeroth. As always here at the Pig and Whistle Inn in Stormwind, I go through a variety of subjects with regards to World of Warcraft. So grab a bottle or a pint, sit back and enjoy it. Today we're going to be going over Dragonflight again. Uh, there has been a lot of interviews uh, since the announcement uh, that they put out, I think just over a week ago. So we're going to be going over what they've been doing in the interviews and sort of the main aspects of it. Uh, some of this might be slightly overlapped from last week, but it's more sort of detailed and more smaller things that, you know, I might not have went into. I might have given the um, the big picture of what they're doing, but not necessarily the smaller details of it, etc. So we'll get into that. But as always, we'll start off with the weekly retail stuff. You have the three world bosses for this week. You have Mortanis, Morgeth and Antros. Again, you get your anima, you get your conduits, get your gear. Head on over there, it's more than worth it. Deepwing Dunk is the brawl for this week. Very simple. You have three different orbs. You take these orbs to the enemy base and you slam dunk them pretty much to gain points. And the enemy does it to you, so you know you need to stop them, etc. It's basically basketball. And uh, Shadowlands Dungeons are... The bonus event for this week, you get an extra reward for completing Shadowlands Dungeons. This includes Mythics, Normals and Heroics. I did that in a really weird order. Uh, It includes Normal, Heroics and Mythics. There we go. That's the uh, better order for that. So let's get into Dragonflight. So this is obviously, there's many different interviews that have been done over the past sort of week, week and a half since they've announced Dragonflight as the latest expansion. Now, there's a list that I've sort of compiled, and it's a lot of the main topics. Obviously, there are other things, such as like gameplay features, system requirements, and stuff like that, that they would recommend. World first race, um, you know, law, uh, and drag fear invokers, like who's going to be sort of important characters in Dragonflight and stuff like that, but. If we have time, I would like to go back to it, but we will just stick on the main subjects for now. So the new race, class combos, Dragon Isles itself, Dragon Riding, the talent tree overhaul. And this is what people have said in interviews, whether it be Ian Hazakosis or part of the team. So Dragon Isles is what we'll start off with. So in Dragonflight, players will team up with uh, the Dragon Expedition, a joint venture uh, between the Explorers League and uh, Re- oh my god, I've already failed at the first uh, tough word. Reliqui- reliqui- my brain just can't comprehend that. Reliquary to explore uh, the mysterious Dragon Isles ancestral home of the dragons, long shrouded from the eyes of mortals, but somewhere has awoken its ancient titanic watchers. Uh, relightening the beacon of Tearhold, uh, the concealment has lifted and summoned the dragon aspects back, signalling the dawn of a new age. Rather than stopping a single villain or world-ending threat, it's a story of exploration and rediscovery, joining characters such as Alex Straza, Caligos, Rathian, and uh, Merthra? Merithra? I'm not sure who that is, actually, uh, in Exploring the Untamed Lands. So with every expansion, we kind of have an idea on who the main antagonist is going to be. So with the the only exception might be Battle for Azeroth, but we had some kind of clues really as to that. Shadowlands, you had the Jailer, who was the big bad of the expansion. Uh, Battle for Azeroth, you had Nazoth, which we didn't necessarily confirm until sort of 9.0. 2, 9.1 or 8.1.5, somewhere around there. So probably several months into the expansion. For Legion, obviously you had uh, big figures from the Legion. You had Kill Jaden and stuff like that. But it was the world soul of Argus and you had to stop Sargeras and stuff like that. So we kind of knew who we were stopping. It's kind of a given. For Warlords of Drain or... It was basically, we didn't necessarily know as much, mainly because of the amount of content that was cut, but we were just stopping the uh, 
Iron Horde initially, and then it turned into the Legion towards the back end of Warlords of Draenor. So it was Archimond, uh, the second in command to, or the third in command technically, uh, to the Burning Legion, which set up the Legion expansion, stuff like that. So we always have an idea on where we're going in an expansion and who the big bad is going to be. There were loads of hints in Battle for Azeroth as to who was going to be the big bad, which was Nazoth. And this can be through basically just quests. This can be through dungeons, the scenery. There was a lot of tentacle old god stuff uh, around Stormsong. And yeah, so you had some kind of idea that there was some weird stuff happening. So it's quite rare that they just sort of want us to explore and rediscover, which is very nice. And it's a different way to play the game, as it were. It's not very much... Point A, point B, we're slowly getting to this big bad. you just got to deal with it in the meantime. Uh, The, obviously, Alexstrasza, Caligos, and Rathian are three of the dragon aspects. And uh, Alexstrasza being the uh, uh, lifebinder, the red aspect. Uh, Or Caligos being the blue aspect. And Rathian being uh, the son of Deathwing from Cataclysm and being the black dragon aspect who... And the black aspect currently have no leader, and that is what Rathian is building up to be from what we all know and have seen. I'm not sure who Marithra is. Hmm. I'm trying to think. You have bronze, and then you... No, it's, it's got to be the green flight. It's got to be the green dragon flight. I'm pretty sure that might be Ysera's daughter or something. Something along them, li- them lines. But you are obviously have a lot of um, different things to explore in the Dragon Isles. You have uh, five new zones. And uh, you even have uh, new Tuscar Otter Mounts, apparently. But the five zones are obviously very lush, expansive. You have uh, loads of foresty areas covered with snow, stuff like that. So they're, they change the scenery quite a bit. And this is going to be one of the biggest continents in World of Warcraft, apparently. So if you look at Northrend, it's going to be either slightly smaller, uh, someone said in an interview, or it's bigger than Northrend, which someone said in an interview as well. They can't necessarily uh, distinguish whether it's a smaller continent or bigger continent. So it's around the same size. If you look at um, Northrend, it has eight zones. Pretty sure. I'm I'm pretty sure. My brain is not telling me otherwise, so yes, I'll go with eight zones. And Dragon Fly only has five, or the Dragon Isles only have five zones. So it shows you how big these zones actually will be in comparison, because you're having to fit three northern zones inside this uh continent when there's only five like actual zones to be in so you're going to get a lot of exploration in and that's probably why they're doing the um dragon riding at the very start so we'll move on to the new race and class combo the drakthir invoker so the uh, draconic drakthir invokers are warcraft's first race slash combo class uh, only drakthir can be invokers and only invokers can be drakthir Uh, Beginning with a unique starting experience before deciding to join the Alliance and Horde, the Invoker specialises in mid-range DPS and uh, healing. Uh, Use breath attacks and limited flying abilities to harness the magical power of all five dragon flights. Similar to Worgen, they feature an independently uh, customised dragon form and uh, non-combat visage form uh, with a huge amount of uh, options to drum out dramatically alter their face and body shape alongside with over 30 different hair colors and unique jewelry options and stuff like that so it's quite it's very rare that we'll see a new class to be honest i didn't think that we'd see a new class in the uh reveal but the holy shit (laughs) um yeah that was definitely a surprise because obviously it's something that you have to commit to a new class you constant tuning uh throughout the expansion in terms of like numbers they might be too overpowered they might be underperforming etc um you have uh, obviously new spells that you might need to introduce going through into new expansions if you want to do stuff like covenants 
again, you're going to have to incorporate another class into that. So that's another... If you put it into the Shadowlands Covenant stuff, you're having to deal with eight different new spells. Wait, eight? Can I count? I don't think I can count. Four different new spells, one for each Covenant. No, there is eight new... Sp- no, I'm I'm so stupid. So stupid. <laughs> there is four new spells uh, for each covenant for the invokers. Now, obviously, this isn't going to be a thing. They're not going to get their own abilities from Shadowlands. But if they wanted to do these sort of covenants again in the future, they will have to add different spells for the invokers. Unless they do a spell for, you know, a universal spell for every single class. But I don't think people would be very much... One for enjoying that because everyone likes the uniqueness of having their own sort of class spells like Convoke the Spirits for Druids, um, you have Maldractus Banner for Warriors, Condemn for Warriors, Abomination Limb for Death Knights. Everyone likes that uniqueness of a new spell and uh, if they're going forward with doing these, um, you know, borrowed power stuff, they wouldn't do it the same way that they have done in like Legion, Battle for Azeroth and stuff like that. They would go a different way about it, but they would have to come up with different spells. And that is a big commitment for a new class. Obviously, we'll have to see if they can, if the Drakthir or if the Invoker can be a different uh, race in the future expansions. But there would have to be something law wise that would make sense because the law behind it is that they were tested and created by Nefarian, who is definitely not Nefarian. Oh my god, I'm so stupid. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, wait, it wasn't Nefarian. Anixia and Nefarian were the children of Deathwing. I forget Deathwing's actual name. Why have I forgotten Deathwing's actual law name? Um, I'm sorry. But they were created by Deathwing uh, through experimentation, so it's going to be very tough to have uh, the Evokers uh, in uh, any, or be playable by any other race going forward without a massive sort of law change, etc. So this is going to be one that I think sticks forever in WoW. And uh, to be honest, I think it's a very good call. It would make no sense for other races to get or be the invokers in all honesty so moving on to dragon riding dragon riding is a new form of aerial movement and exploration unique to the dragon isles in which players will use momentum and gravity to dive and soar at breakneck speeds across the sky uh, unlike normal flying the feature will be leaned at very uh, or learned very early on in dragonfight campaign and plays an integral role in progressing from the sea level uh, waking shore to the high altitude mountains of... Uh, God, I hate learning names of new places in well. Thaldras... Thaldrasus. Thaldrasus. I'm going to go with that. Uh, to, accompany, to accomplish this, players will obtain four new drakes... Uh, Warcraft's fully, or uh, first fully customizational mounts with unique animations and options to make them uh, look truly unique. As you grow in skill, you unlock new abilities and maneuvers to reach new locations and truly master the skies. So, first fully customizable mounts is such a good way to go about this. It's your own personal mount. Now, now everyone collects mounts. Everyone collects mounts, some more rare than others, such as the woolly white rhino is very collective. The blizzcon like uh, polar bear is a very sought after thing. Spectral tiger from a trading card game is very sought after, stuff like that. But this one, you it's so unique because you can have it. It's all yours and the chance of you running into someone with the exact same customizable like mount as you is super slim there will always be something that's off so this is really cool and you get to customize it and you get to find new things for it you it's basically like transmog but for a mount which is absolutely insane and yeah this is a massive win in my book now what they say here 
you unlock new abilities and maneuvers to reach new locations is uh, something that's really cool so you're sort of it's sort of how to train your dragon pretty much um which is really cool you're basically in an interview they've said that there's going to be puzzles that you can only sort through dragon riding which means that this is not related to player power it's more of a mini game on its own and uh, this is what I think everyone in the player base has sort of been asking for. They're looking for these sort of mini games and progression systems that do not tie to player power at all. This is very much, if you want to uh, uh, progress this further, you are completely free to do so without any time restraints. You are completely free to do so without it affecting how powerful and how much damage you can output with your character, etc. So... This is an absolute bonus. Dragon Riding sounds amazing. To me, I've played a lot of Ark. I've mentioned Ark, I think, a couple months ago in a podcast. And there's a couple of uh, um, dinosaurs, mythological creatures that specialize in the momentum and the diving into the sore, etc. Um, sort of movement. So I basically have been playing Ark for this moment. And um, I've been practicing and I'm pretty good at it. So as soon as I get my dragon ride in, I'll be a bit more fluent than others. But obviously it won't be too hard to pick up, I would imagine. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of where you would unlock these abilities and maneuvers um, for your dragon, pretty much. So it's a good fun little progression system. And that doesn't tie into player power at all, which is the best part about it. So, talent tree overhaul. Now, the talents that we have right now are from Mr. Pandaria. And they're going back to somewhat of the older system, but not necessarily. It's kind of all branched into one another, etc. So one of the biggest features coming to Dragonflight is the complete overhaul of talents and uh, reintroduction of the traditional talent trees. Unlike the originals, however, players will continue to select a specialization, giving them access to both a dedicated specialization talent tree and a common class tree with a dedicated pool of talent points for each. The class tree will focus on things like utility, mobility, crowd control, and basic class abilities, while the specialization tree grants uh, performance-enhancing uh, active and passive abilities. This way, you won't feel pressured to give up performance for utility. Additionally, players uh, will be able to save multiple talent loadouts, which can be seamlessly switched between while out of combat and imported or exported to easily share with others. This is so good. This is absolutely amazing. Don't get me wrong, the talent trees that we have, they do a good job. You know, so it's a very simple system, but it has a big impact on how you play your character. This, it just feels more fulfilling to the players. Um... And uh, while you're leveling, it feels more fulfilling because you're uh, putting a point every time you get a level past level 10. So the uh, different trees, you obviously have the class specific and the specialization specific. The class one is obviously going to be sort of your, if you look at Druid, I've got Druid as an example here. You have your Skull Bash, which is usually a Feral and Guardian ability. Um, but that is now in the Druin, uh, Druid's baseline talent tree, which you can spec into. So all of the specializations can have it. You can have it as a resto, you can have it as a balanced Druid, etc. And then it goes into your balance uh, tree talent points, where you can go into something like Convoke the Spirits or Fury of a Loon. You can go into a more AoE type build or a more single target, it looks like. So there's loads of different options. And uh, it looks like they're going to be great fun. I'm not too sure, but there's a couple of diamonds next to the uh, uh, talent trees that I'm not too sure about and what they do. And there's nothing that says about them at the moment. So we're only going to have to wait and see for that. But 
this looks so much more fulfilling than the current talent trees that we have right now, purely because you get to play around with it a bit more and experience a lot more different uh, play styles and stuff. Now, the talent tree you get right now does the same, but you feel a lot more in control and very specific with what you want to be rather than just, okay, I've got to go with bash because I need a stun over a route or something or what, you know, it's a lot more fine combed and detailed. These talent trees. Uh, One that I wasn't expecting was reputation from renown. So renown is the system that obviously we have in the shadowlands. You go from one to 80 renown right now. And we have a progression bar for it. This progression bar shows you what you get at each level of renown. So at level 40 renown, you get a mount and a title. And, you know, it sh- you can easily scroll through and see what you get at each uh, certain level. So Renown is making a return in Dragonflight, providing a more streamlined way to measure uh, reputation progress and rewards on a visible track. Unlike Shadowlands, however, all reputations can be progressed simultaneously uh, with more open-ended objectives that players can work towards at their own pace, rather than repeating the same structured weekly quests that Covenants used uh, in Shadowlands. Reputation rewards will include cosmetics for gear, uh, for outdoor players who don't do Mythic Plus or Raid, but no extra player power outside of what's available elsewhere. I like that they specify that there is no extra player power. Uh, I think uh, having to do reputation to get some player power is never fun, and it's a very, it grinds on the player base to actually do the tasks for gear rather than for the enjoyment of it. So if people enjoy doing the like stuff that they don't necessarily have to do, then that is a big win. Whereas if they have to do something that they don't enjoy, it's a big negative. And I think Blizzard have started to realize that, which is really, really good. And uh, I'm glad that they're taking it in this sort of direction. There's not much more that you can say about that. But, you know, it's just nice to have a sort of track and keep a record of where you are and what you're going to get in the upcoming sort of uh, levels of your reputation. The professions update. I'm pretty sure I went over this, but I'll still go for it. Uh, Dragonflight features several profession updates, including profession statistics. Uh, Crafting quality, finishing uh, reagents, crafting tables, work orders and specialisations. Along with a new UI for keeping track of these details, players will be able to enhance the quality and power of created items. Uh, Complete work orders to allow other players to equip items elsewhere, soulbound to the crafter and more. So this is basically a profession revamp. Uh, the crafting quality is very good, obviously. The statistics, I'm not too sure about. Uh, the specializations are very good uh, because they bring back a classic uh, Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King feel, where you could specialize into a certain uh, area of your profession. So if you were a blacksmith, you can go armor, you can go weapons, you can go something else, I'm pretty sure. If you're a leather worker, you can go tribal, you can go elemental leather working and there was one more which i forget as well uh the ones that i forget are probably not used uh, by most people because they're awful but yeah the specializations are always good and they give it a lot more diversity to play around with and it makes the it makes the choice of your profession and the specialization a lot more meaningful to the player rather than just oh i've got alchemy i can make potions now that kind of thing so Moving on to the UI overhaul, the UI is getting a substantial change, not substantial, but it's being a lot more tidy and sort of 2022, we'll say. So uh, another quality of life update coming to Dragonflight is the user uh, interface the and the HUD, which players can customize and reposition, reposition in-game without the use of add-ons. The new functionality doesn't replace add-ons entirely and players can still use dedicated add-ons for unique looks, themes or to show information in different ways. 
but these new features are intended to improve the baseline experience so the players looking to customise their HUD don't necessarily have to use add-ons in order to do so. I'm looking at the add-on or the HUD and it looks very clean. It looks very professional. And honestly, in my opinion, I use Domino's as an add-on. Domino's is basically you get 12 different bars and you just stack them wherever you want. And uh, I prefer the Blizzard UI because of how clean it looks. It looks like a it looks like Domino's, so I'm hoping that you can add more um bars to it and stuff like that. So it might be something that I actually revert to. And I haven't used the default Blizzard UI since Oh good god. I think Cataclysm maybe Mr. Pandaria. So several years plus um I haven't used the Blizzard UI and mainly because I just didn't like it. I didn't like the look of it. I didn't like the feel. The one that they have done, the sort of overhaul of it, looks and probably feels a very uh nice to use because it will feel very comfortable with me um using dominoes for the past few years it looks very similar to that add-on so we'll move on to leveling and chromy time so with dragonfly uh increasing the level cap to 70 shadowlands will be added to chromy time uh allowing new characters to select their beginning or and select and begin their leveling process with that expansion if they choose to do so. However, brand new players will continue to be directed from Exile's Reach into Battle for Azeroth for their journey to level 60 because entering Dragonfly rather than starting with Shadowlands. So, Shadowlands is basically going into Chromie Time. For those of you that don't know, Chromie Time is very simple. You pick an expansion that you wish to level in on an alt. And you go to that expansion and level there. So Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, Cataclysm, Mists of Pandaria, Wall of the Draenor, Legion, Battle for Azeroth, and uh, now Shadowlands. For those who are new to the game, they will always go to Battle for Azeroth. Some people have said that they might go to Shadowlands, but that is yet to be decided. Battle for Azeroth would make more sense from a new player's point of view because it is on Azeroth rather than Shadowlands being somewhere off-world that they might not understand lore-wise what is happening, etc. So there's a bit of dispute as to which one that they'll go to from the interviews, but I'm guessing it will be Battle for Azeroth. So, Mythic plus Dungeon Seasonal Rotations. Uh, in an effort to reduce the fatigue from running the same dungeons and re-farming the same loot, over the course of an expansion, Dragonflight is introducing a new seasonal dungeon rotation. Of the eight new dungeons, Season 1 will feature Mythic Plus versions of four of the Dragonflight dungeons, alongside four from previous expansions like Mists of Pandaria and Warlords of Draenor in Season 2. Uh, or, yeah, full stop. In Season 2, these uh, dungeons will rotate out, be replaced by the other four Dragonflight dungeons, and four other previous expansion dungeons that have never had Mythic Plus versions before, as well as providing an itemization refresh, refresh from season to season. The intent is for the dungeon gameplay itself to feel fresher and introduce a new set of puzzles for the community to solve each season. This is massive. So every expansion since Mythic Plus, you've had Legion, Battle for Azeroth, and Shadowlands, all of the dungeons from that um, expansion have been in Mythic Plus. And all you would do after each season, uh, after each season had ended and the new season had started, you would go to the dungeons that you already had gear from and you would farm that same gear at a, at a higher item level to increase your player power. Well, that won't be the case. You'll have to find an entirely new set of gear because the dungeons from your previous season will not be in the rotation. So you'll have to find a new best in slot list. You'll have to do new dungeons to get your best in slot. We don't necessarily know what dungeons they're going to be from the old uh, seasonal rotation, the old sort of um, Missa Pandaria, Warlords of Draenor dungeons. 
So people will have to do their research, maybe find out some pathing to go through them dungeons, etc. But this is really good and really healthy for Mythic Plus and PvE content, in my opinion. And it will bring back all of the other dungeons that they've done in the game and just keep them alive forever, pretty much. Any dungeon that they put into the game now always will be a Mythic Plus and that won't ever change, I don't think. PvP gear and solo shuffle arena mode. This one's good. So based on community feedback, PvP gear in the new expansion will work similar to Warlords of Draenor with uh, a separate PvE and PvP item level on each piece of gear. In PvP content, all conquest gear will be uh, uh, equivalent to the item level of mythic raid gear, regardless of personal rating. Outside of PvP content, the gear will work similar to Shadowlands, starting at a base item level that is unlocked with the rating and upgraded with honor to increase its effectiveness in PvE activities. Additionally, the solo brawl introduced in Eternity's End is being converted into a rated arena mode with its own rewards and separate rating system. So, the way that you upgrade your PvE or PvP gear for your PvE is through your rating and you would upgrade it like you currently do in Shadowlands through spending honour to upgrade it a rank or two, etc. Now, once you buy this PvP gear, in PvP, it will be a set item level and will not change no matter what rank the gear is, which is incredibly good because you'd always be slacking on a couple pieces of gear. You wouldn't have necessarily enough honor to upgrade them and stuff like that. It was kind of a bit of a ball ache, I'm not going to lie. So for them to do this is massive and it shows that they're listening to at least the PvP community side and it makes sense that they're doing the PvE uh, upgrade thing, mainly because the Season 1 of Shadowlands, the best gear that you could get for dungeons was PvP gear. that was, like, fully upgraded. It just wasn't even a contest. So I understand why they're doing the PvE section, because the PvP players don't necessarily want to do PvE, so it doesn't bother them as much. And I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. So... They are the main talking points of Dragonfly. Again, might have went over some from last week, but it's a little bit more detail, and we've gotten a bit more detail through the interviews that have occurred over the past couple of weeks. But, you know, it's it's getting exciting. I'm expecting to hear an announcement for the latest patch, 9.2.5, and when that will go live, I suspect next month. Probably end of the month at the very latest, which will be really good. And then... There has been a 10.0 uh, encryption on the PTR already that Wowhead have dug up for us. They have gone through the little files and found. So it's there. It's it's there. It's waiting to go on PTR. They just need to get the uh, latest patch out of the way. But thank you all very much for listening. As always, do check out all of the social medias. Check out YouTube, Twitch, all of that. I'm a Patreon member as well. Really supports the um the podcast channel. But once again, go with Valor, friend. Goodbye all. <laughs>